I'm going to officially transition to the Q&A portion, which we've got uh, 23 minutes for, which I think is plenty of time. Uh, we have some questions from the audience and some questions prepared. And I thought I would start by asking all of our panelists, um, what is one piece of advice you wish you could give yourself at the start of your career? So I think we have some of our audience are at the beginning. I'm assuming a lot of our at the beginning, maybe some are mid-career. But either way, what is something that you really would want what advice do you wish you heard when you're at the beginning of your career? Um, and uh, Shelly and Anya, maybe one of you can go first and Michael, feel free to go after that if you have something to add. That's such a good question. Um, what advice would I give myself? I think looking back now um, at how I ended up here where I am, I would encourage you to look for companies or career paths that afford you some sort of flexibility in shaping your role. So don't necessarily look for the role specifically as it is listed in the job posting and whether that um, allows you to bring in your language skills or not, but maybe look at the company itself. How do they hire? What is their culture? Um, how do people move throughout the company? So those are good questions to explore in job interviews with companies and go for those that allow some flexibility where you see some examples of people starting out one way and then ending up another. I, Michael, I think, is actually a great example of that. Um, and then to go back to the translation piece just a little bit, maybe don't be intimidated by all of the things you have to be to be a freelancer, right? You'll learn those things that will come. Don't let that stop you. There are ways to gain that knowledge. Don't um, go for something that feels safe. Be a little bit bold and put yourself out there. The rest will come. Thank you for saying that, Anya. I, I think I realized how we can make presentation, how scary it all sounded, the freelancing um, freelancing part. I don't mean to scare anybody away. It's really a lot of fun. Um, and I think Elizabeth answered a question, asked a question about that that I'd like to answer in more detail if we have time too. But um, advice, if I could give myself some advice early on in my career, I think it would be to um, be braver about saying no, actually. Um, when you're starting out as a freelancer, especially, there are all these different opportunities coming your way. Well, first of all, they don't come your way right away. So when you do get opportunities, when you do get job offers, it's really exciting. Um, but then you start getting too many of them and you have to pick and choose. And it's really hard to say no, because you can, you always have this feeling, this fear that if I say no to this client or this job, they'll disappear forever and I'll never get another job offer and it'll be the end of my career. But that's not true. It's never true. Um, so you have to be able to say no for your own sanity. Also, there's no boss telling you to go home at five o'clock every day. Um, and a lot of freelancers get sucked into this thing, um, this routine of thinking you have to work constantly, you have to work all the time, you have to take all the jobs, you, you can't sleep, you can't eat, um, and it's bad for you. <laughs> you can't sustain that type of, of work for very long. Um, so you'll be a better translator and a happier, healthier person if you know how to say no to certain things. Yeah, I think one thing I'll add is um, advice that I would have given myself is it, it's it's okay if you don't feel a hundred percent qualified at the beginning, uh, and you and that's usually a sign of you're in a position to grow and you can grow into your qualifications and competence and yeah, not to to panic if you feel like you're a little out of your comfort zone. <laughs> I think that's excellent advice that lots of us can still use. <laughs> um, so we have one question from Elizabeth Doty. Uh, she says, I'm wondering what route, so this is actually for Shelly specifically, I'm wondering what route you personally took for secondary education slash what you did to gain those translation and business skills in a structured way. Did you get degrees in business or applied linguistics? Uh, did you learn on your own? Particularly interested in film slash literary translation and was considering a comparative literature and considering comparative literature. Okay, feel free to answer Shelley. Yeah, Elizabeth, I didn't um, talk about my own kind of educational background much. Um, every freelance translator will answer that question differently. Um, but for me, I, I studied political science, international relations um, at Johns Hopkins University. So I knew I wanted to do something in the international arena. I thought it was gonna be politics, maybe history. I studied Russian. Um, after college, I joined the Peace Corps and they conveniently sent me to Russia. So I lived in a small Russian city um, for two years. So that's my kind of immersion language experience. Um, after that, I came back and worked for the US government. The Department of Justice was running criminal justice reform programs in the former Soviet Union. So I did a lot of work 
um, in that area, learned a lot about criminal justice, got to travel around the region. Um, and there, um, one of my jobs once was to translate a bunch of news articles on Russia's ongoing attempts to reform their criminal justice system at the time. So that was my first experience with a lot of translation of um, technical material. Um, so that was a great experience because I got paid to practice those translation skills. Um, practicing, you know, kind of absorbing new terminology, figuring out like the journalistic way of speaking, figuring out how to best convey all that in English. Um, after that, I went to grad school. I did my master's at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, there I studied Russian, East European, and Central Asian studies again, so area studies, and um, studied Uzbek as well. And by that time, I was doing a little bit of freelance translation added was back to my kind of resume for freelance translation into certain areas. Um, um, I had a part-time job after that. I had kids. I didn't want to work full-time. Um, and gradually the freelancing started taking more and more of my time as I had more clients, more projects. Um, so I quit my day job in I think 2011 or so. I started freelancing full-time. So that's my path. Other freelance translators will work as a chemist for 30 years and retire and then translate chemistry texts or translate for patents or something like that. Um, if you want to do film and literature, a lot of translators who work in those fields do study comparative literature or composition, writing, um, um, which is a great route to go as well. But I guess I, I'd, I'd advise most people who want to do freelance translation to get as much kind of real world and non-academic experience as you can as well, because that's how you're going to learn to talk about different things, talk about them in different ways. Um, and you can put all those skills to work in your freelance career as well. For business skills, I mean, honestly, I, I found a book in the library called like Small Business Kit for Dummies, <laughs> and I read that. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be like a sophisticated business education. But that gave me ideas like, oh, I should have a form for invoices. I should have a standard contract I use, that kind of thing. And then if you join translator associations like um, the American Literary Translators Association or ATA, they have a whole package of things available to members like um, standard contracts, marketing advice, um, networking advice, things like that. So you can, can pick up those skills as you go. Don't be afraid. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and then a question for Anya here is, do instructors from Mango languages have to be native speakers? So I do, I did just answer that in the um, chat, but I'll respond here too. So for most of our language specific things, instructors, content developers, and so on, yes, we are primarily looking for native speakers. Um, that's part of the quality standards we have, obviously, for our course and content development. Um, sometimes near native fluent speakers um, are acceptable as well, because we understand that for some languages, it's just harder to find. As I said earlier, sometimes you have your pick of the litter. We struggle a little bit more to find talent for those languages. So there are a few languages where it's really not that easy to find the types of um, talent that, that we're looking for. So we just can't um, expect a, a native speaker necessarily. We have to branch out just a little bit. And then, as I mentioned, for all of those full-time roles, for employees, for full-time contractors that we're hiring for, um, that is certainly not a requirement. There, we look for the skill specifically. So if you want to be in marketing, we look for your marketing background. If you want to be in linguists uh, and, and the linguist team, my team, we look for your linguistics background and so on. Great. I thought I had a question prepared next, but then I blanked on it. So while I look at my little list here, I wonder if Marissa has anything from the chat that I haven't addressed yet. And if not, I remembered the question I wanted to ask, but <laughs> so the question that I think applies maybe to everyone, maybe more to Shelly and Anya is um, to what degree, if at all, have things like Google Translate been threatening translation work? Um, as an outsider, it seems like I don't know, kind of threatening, I guess. So, so how does that impact the industry uh, as a whole? And perhaps it also applies actually to Michael as far as like how translation happens at Epic and all that. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit if you want. Um, mostly we laugh at people who think that translators are gonna be replaced by Google. <laughs> um, people are just a lot smarter than Google um, and we do language better. Um, so that's the, the very short answer. Um, not to say that machine translation isn't getting better and better all the time, and it is, and it's useful. So one of my clients is um, 
does a lot of work for the IT sector. And they have an online tool that they use to translate um, strings like Michael was talking about for software. And one thing Google Translate is really good at translating is strings of software. <laughs> um, go figure. Um, so when I have a text from them that's like a user, you know, user interface uh, for a website, a lot of it Google does do really well. And my job is just to go through and check and make sure this is appropriate, this is appropriate, this is appropriate. Sometimes it gets it completely wrong and I have to, you know, use my human brain to, to fix it up. So I don't feel threatened by, by machine translation. It helps us in our work sometimes in certain fields. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you can write a dissertation on it or two, but that's my short answer. Yeah, and at Epic, uh, our translation teams use trained machine translation models as a foundation to help with the translation workflow, but we certainly still need that human intervention to correct the strings. Um, and that's even after having, we use Google machine translation and then train it on our past strings and translations that we've deemed of high quality. Um, certain languages, the machine translation might be, uh, you know, 70% of the time, it's fully accurate in terms of what a, the translator would put, but then that other 30% of the time, it might mess up a lot. Um, some languages like Finnish are very difficult for machine translation and it, it needs a lot more of the, the human intervention to make the strings, their translations actually high enough quality. Yeah, but um, it, overall machine translation is just a way to boost the productivity of the translator. And just to round this out for the language learning industry itself, I don't think um, this is a threat at all. Language teaching is not something that can easily be automated. You need people who know about second language acquisition principles and who read the latest research on how the brain works, how people really learn languages and all the new things that we're learning day to day so that that industry isn't threatened by that at all. We just do our thing that we know works in how we, uh, how people learn languages and how we need to be teaching languages. I'm happy to hear that, <laughs> that it's not too much of a threat. That is good to hear. Um, and then I just wanted to plug for the audience real quick that um, you can, that most of our panelists here, I believe uh, are also exhibitors on, on the uh, career fair website. So I'm just gonna plug that into the chat. So if you're thinking, oh no, what was the website for Mango Languages again? Well, I just double checked. Mango Languages are in fact, is in fact one of our exhibitors. So you can find their information there and get in touch. So, and um, this is currently being recorded and will be shared early next week. So don't worry about losing anything. Uh, you'll have another chance to get it. Um, and then I have a question about freelancing. So it sounds like Anya maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, started out freelancing, ended up at Mango, whereas Shelly started doing other things and ended up freelancing. And I'm curious kind of how that played a role in your career. So did freelancing for Anya like help you get into the into the career that you wanted to, to be in? And for Shelly, maybe it was kind of an opposite transition. Um, if, if both of you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I wanted to be a freelancer. That's how I started. That's why I started as a freelancer. Um, and I was very happy doing that for quite some time. Uh, like I said, um, in the beginning, it could be a little bit threatening. For example, I did not think at all when I got into this about the business side of things and all the things I had to do. I learned those the hard way as I got into them, um, but I actually really enjoyed all of those pieces. I really enjoyed not just my translation work, which is when I chose my career track, when I chose my major is all I thought about. Oh, I'm going to be translating. Fantastic. Um, but also the advertising, the, the business pieces, I really enjoy bringing those pieces together. So I did that for quite some time and um, had a lot of fun doing that. And I really ended up where I am kind of by coincidence. Um, Mango Languages found me at some point and they were one of my clients for quite some time. And I just provided a little bit of work for them here and there. And then at some point moved into a full-time role with them. So I started freelancing on purpose, very much enjoyed it but also enjoy where I am today. So that, that stability piece, um, I realize is something that can be really, really stressful. Um, it isn't for everybody, as Shelly said, this is something that you need to figure out if that's how you can work. It really also depends on your client base, right? Um, if you 
have lots of small clients and you constantly need to be busy um, bringing more clients in that can be more stressful than if you settle, for example, by chance sometimes into a place where you have several larger clients that bring you work consistently over many, many years, it gets a little bit more comfortable that way. So it really depends on what particularly you're pursuing, how you want to work, how much of your time you want to spend on these different pieces. Um, but I'm very happy about where I ended up. Um, I do sometimes look back at my freelance days and, and miss those a little bit. They were quite fun. I really enjoyed that work. Um, but I'm also super happy where I am today because my work is still very varied. So I do lots of different things every day, every week. It's never the same. And that's something that's a lot of fun for me too. Yeah, I think Anya and I um, think the same way about this kind of thing. We just had the opposite, kind of the opposite order. Yes, yeah, so I always thought I would work for the government or um, diplomacy or something. Um, but I, you know, dipped my toe into the freelancing waters and really liked it um, and just kept doing more and more. And now by this point, I think I'm so used to working for myself um, and working in my little office here that I don't think I'm fit to be an employee anymore. I don't think I would be a very good employee for a boss. Um, so I'm stuck here now, but I, I like it a lot. Um, it's, you know, it's perfect for me, but I'm glad I had the experience working, um, you know, you know, in a real job as well with benefits and structure and things too. That was good for me. So both things, both things are, are useful. Yeah. And I enjoyed the pros and cons list because there are definitely pros and there are definitely cons. Some people really can't really work without a manager helping direct their, their work and other people really can't stand working for someone else. So um, I appreciate that you sharing that for, with everyone. Um, so we have six minutes left and I have a question that we can end with, but I wanted to see it's your last chance to submit any questions in the chat that I maybe didn't get to address. Um, so I'll keep an eye on that. But for now, I'll say that the last question is probably going to be um, what skill other than language fluency do you think is the most relevant in your career specifically? So there's languages, but there's probably something else that has made you successful in what you do today or that you found to be very necessary, or perhaps a skill that you wish you had that you think would make your life easier. If you need a few seconds to think about that, that's fine. Uh, and whoever is ready to go first, feel free to do so. I'll go with a hard skill and a couple of soft skills. Um, hard skill, I would say organization. I think this applies across the board to both the freelance and the employment, um, you need to learn or know or be good at organizing yourself and the influx of all of the work that you have. Um, this really is regardless of whether you're managing your own work or you're managing the work that your company provides to you. This is really something to practice. Practice project management with little tools, um, pra practice. Um, if you aren't managing a lot of things in your work right now or in your studies, practice with you know vacation planning or something like that. Look at project management tools out there and see how you can apply that to your own life. And then soft skills that are always, always important would be adaptability and curiosity. Be curious about other things that are out there and be adaptable to whatever may come your way because your career may take turns that you didn't necessarily anticipate or you're not seeing right now, but that end up being really satisfying for you. I'd say um, communication in general is a good skill. Um, you know, translation is a type of communication, of course. You also have to be able to communicate with your clients, with your colleagues, um, effectively, professionally, efficiently, clearly. Um, so this is more like almost business communication skills um, to get across, um, you know, what you want to say to them, as well as uh, as well as, as well as the communication you do to help your clients communicate in the language you're translating into. Yeah, I would definitely echo what Anya and Shelley um, said, and um, I think yeah, having that workload management and just those project management skills are very essential in terms of being able to um, keep track of like what is your workload, how much can you handle, what in setting expectations, what deadlines can you set, like Shelly's spreadsheet that she was showing where she's able to you know very systematically manage what time, how much time she has for her tasks, and 
um, if you can communicate those expectations clearly to your colleagues and to your customers, that, that shuts you up for success. Great. Um, thank you all so much. This has been really, really fun for me, way more fun than I was expecting. Uh, Michael, Anya, Shelley, I feel like I learned a lot from all three of you about all these different skills. I'm not working in translation, but I found this to be, yeah, very enlightening. So thank you for being here today and taking up this time to spend with us. Um, I really appreciate your time and hope you enjoy the career fair uh, audience and panelists. Um, if you have any further questions or wish to get in contact with one of our panelists or their organization, uh, we'll be happy to help. You can check out the Lichtel Career Fair website. There's all the information you need there to get in touch uh, with me um, and I can help you get in touch with anyone else you need to get in touch with. Um, and we encourage you to check out the Career Fair exhibitors on the website. Many of our panelists are exhibitors, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you can find the information there. And if you wish to see other panels uh, that were happening at the same time, we'll be uploading a recording of the event on the Facebook page next week and also emailing it out, I believe. Um, and for those of you still wondering what to do next, the Lictal, the Lictal website uh, also has a what's next tab with more information on how you can continue with your language learning journey. So thank you again so much for being being here and attending and I hope everyone here has a great evening. All right. Thank you.